Hello and welcome to The Reset, a mental health podcast without all the bollocks. I'm Sam Delaney. My guest this week is Adrian Durham, one of the most familiar names in sports broadcasting. Adrian is an old colleague of mine from my talk sport days, a bloke I always looked up to for his razor sharp insights, his humour, his courage to be different and his ability to be relentlessly interesting in a world that's often full of cliché. He's been one of the main voices on TalkSport for 25 years and he's still going strong today. I spoke to him down the line from Germany where he was covering the Euros. Just recently, Adrian let me know they have made the decision to quit drinking. Not an easy thing to do when you're on the road with the TalkSport team all the time. But I was delighted to hear that he'd recently completed his first year booze free and was really enjoying it. So I asked him to come on the show to tell me about why he made the decision and I learned a great deal more about his fascinating life. As you'd imagine, if you're familiar with his work on the radio, Adrian was an excellent guest. Funny, smart, but also really open and honest about himself too. I hope you enjoy listening to our chat. Adrian Durham, welcome to The Reset. It's an honour to be here, mate. Thanks for inviting me. Oh, it's a real pleasure. Um, You're out in Germany for the Euros, working hard. Um, in in Dusseldorf right now, which I'm sure is very exciting. But something else has coincided with that, which brings us together today. I happen to know that yesterday was your one year anniversary since you quit drink. So big congratulations on that, mate. Well, thank you very much. Um, and it's almost ironic that it's happened the anniversary in the middle of a talk sport tour to yeah. Germany. <laughs> yeah. So, but yeah, thank you very much. It, I feel really, really positive about it never thought it would last a year but I feel really good about it to be honest with you so thank you very much yeah well I I know you feel good about it and I think that's wonderful and you you know from what I can establish from the chats we've had you weren't one of these people who thought right that's it I'm drawing a line under it I've got to make a big change you thought I'll give this a go which is how so many people do it and you just presumably you, you thought I'll give it a go but you loved it so much you just stuck with it well I mean, I'll tell you the story of how exactly it happened. And that was, and it was, you're right, it was very much a, I'll give it a go, because I, I didn't think I would be able to to last very long. I thought it'd be two or three weeks. But what happened was, so um, I, I found out I had a half-brother, maybe uh, it's kind of 18 months ago, I found out I had a half-brother I didn't know about, yeah. never met him. Before, and we, he, he didn't know about me and... We connected, um, met up for a couple of times. And the second time we met up, we met up in Wolverhampton, which was where our dad had passed away exactly a year before, Mm. which was also June the 25th. So we met up on on June the 25th, a year after he'd um, passed away uh, in Wolverhampton. Me and my half-brother met up there for the second time we'd met. And... um, I was driving, so I wasn't, I never, I've got zero tolerance alcohol driving, so I never drink anything when I'm driving anyway. But these, I was with my half-brother, his wife, and my sister, full sister, and they were all having a drink, not getting drunk or anything. And I was driving them all back home to various parts of the country. So it was a really weird day. There was not a lot to celebrate about our dad's life. Neither of us had met him. I mean, he wasn't a great bloke, so... I just felt really weird all day. And then when dropping these people off, I thought, you know, my dad was a bit of a drinker by all accounts and I didn't want to go down that route. So I just thought, you know what? I've not had a drink all day. I've been around people who've been drinking and it's not been a problem. I'll literally just give it a go. Mm. So that day I just just decided I'd give it a go. And it's lasted a year and it's been very easy, to be honest with you. You were one of the inspirations for it because I'd listened to you a couple of times on a podcast and on TalkSport as well, Mm. talking about how you're an authentic football fan, which is one of the great things about you. But you you don't drink, even though you're around football fans who do drink. And I was thinking, how the hell does he do that? When I'm listening to you talking about it, I'm thinking, how the hell does he do that? I'd love to do that, but I just don't think it's going to be able to happen. Mm. And yet I gave it a go and here I am. So I feel great about it. But you were part of the inspiration, no doubt. Oh, well, it's great to hear that, mate. Um, and uh, and I'm glad that made a connection because it's so interesting, the fact that football fans in particular, it's the main thing that they say. I, I can live without drink. I don't mind. But football, I just, they can't. And I was the same. You can't envisage football without beer. 
or alcohol. And it's strange. But then when you do it, you what the main thing I realized was, oh, it's OK, because I really like football. <laughs> do, you, do you know what I mean? Like, I don't need the drink to make me like football. I like it anyway. And but and also surprising, I suppose, is that I still like the kind of raucous atmosphere. I thought that it would annoy me or make me feel uncomfortable if I wasn't part of it on the beer. But kind of, I, I still enjoy that atmosphere, even if I'm not on the beer. Is that, I mean, obviously you're working at a lot of the games you're at, so mm. it's a little bit different. But, you know, when you go as as a fan or you're in that kind of an atmosphere or you're out there with talk sport, is that the thing that you thought you'd struggle with and how did it turn out to be? Yeah, it's a very similar thing to, to what you've just said, except mine is work and it's being around work people, not just talk sport people, but you'll do, so like the England game in, in Cologne last night, we finished the game and, um, you know, you everybody's having a beer mm. and that's what you're meant to do and it's what I used to do and I used to enjoy that. But now I just ask for a non-alcoholic beer. Nobody ever. That's been one of the beautiful things. Nobody's said a word about it. Nobody's taken the piss. Nobody's had a laugh about it. Nobody's said to me, oh, go on, you've got to have a beer. Or England yeah. was so bad, you must need a drink yeah. that's alcoholic. Nobody has put pressure on me. And I just I, I take this opportunity to thank everybody around me for not putting any pressure on me whatsoever. The only time I've ever had pressure was once at a restaurant and a waiter just looked at me like I was from another planet. <laughs> An alcohol-free Peroni, but you know that's the <laughs> only time anybody's done anything like that. I thought it would be more difficult being around the people I'm around. So I'm working with talk sport people a lot, and I think to the outside world there might be a perception that talk sport football drink is a thing. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they they go together. In my world, and I've been at talk sport since it started. In my world, that doesn't exist. That that link doesn't exist. But I understand why the perception might be there. Mm -hmm. So, and that perception might make it difficult if fans are around, hang on, what, what's he doing not having a drink, that kind of thing. But it's, none of that has been a problem whatsoever. And in terms of the enjoyment of the, of the game, absolutely, I get full enjoyment from it, even though there's, there's no beer involved whatsoever. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if anything, I enjoy it more. Because, I mean, the amount of games, I mean, you know, obviously the easy gag is it was quite good to not remember or be able to quite see West Ham over the years properly because so much of it was awful. But I, I genuinely like there's games that I know I was at or people say, do you remember that game? And I'm like, I've got no recollection of it because it was so synonymous with drinking. So now I, I go with my son and I really, <laughs> I sort of found that I've started to enjoy both football and live music on a, on a deeper level because mm. I'm so much more engaged in it in two things that I always loved anyway and then suddenly you ramp up the sort of engagement with it because your your mind's so focused um I just go back to like uh, what you're saying about the people around you that's something that resonates with me the fact that I felt I don't think I consciously felt but I, it just a lingering fear was that I would get shit from people around me who were mm. drinkers and most of the people I hung around with to some degree or another were drinkers that was my lifestyle, whether it was football or anything else, work. You know, it was always seemed to be around drinking. And and I, I'm the same. It's it's incredible the response that, that you get. Uh, my favourite response, though, is indifference. Like, it's nice when people say, well done, mate. Do you know what I mean? That's quite nice, yeah. but I feel a bit awkward sometimes. The best response is just like utter disinterest, isn't it? Is, is that something that you found at work <laughs> and from mates? Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's a great way of putting it. Um, I think that when I've had people saying to me, um, like this week with the anniversary, for example, uh, when I've mentioned it, in fact, I was out for a beer and uh, with um, Matt Holland, uh, yeah. who's a worker for another broadcaster, Stuart Pierce, um, Jim Proudfoot, our commentator, a few others, producers were in there as well, Deck. And the, Matt was taking an order and I explained, so I hadn't seen Matt for a while. I said, um, an alcohol free beer, please. Um, and it's actually on my anniversary, not drinking tomorrow. And um, he said, oh, oh congratulations. And uh, that's fantastic. I said, I didn't have a problem, mate. You know, there, there was no, I, I didn't yeah. have an issue. I wasn't going to AA or anything. And yeah. I didn't have a problem. But, and he said, no, 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 but it's, it's great. You know, you, you've got the willpower to do that. I would, I, and I understood where he's coming from, and it, it's all coming from a good place. You know, it's good sentiment. Mm. But the reality is, it should be normalised, and it should be indifference. It's like, mm. what do you want to drink? 
I'll have an alcohol free beer and on you go and get one. You know, yeah. that, that that should be the same thing. You know, I think that and I think that time is coming. But previously I've been out and if somebody has said, oh, I'll just have a Coke, you know, well, you know, the world has stopped spinning and everybody's asking what the hell's wrong with him. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Especially in that. I'm not talking about talk sport now. I think in previous, maybe the 2000 to 2010 decade, mm. it really there was a big drinking culture. And if you if somebody in the group had a Coca Cola in the middle of a round, you know they needed therapy. You know there was something <laughs> wrong with them. Yeah. Now I think things are very very different, um, and and I'm pleased about that. And again, I just want to say everybody's made it so easy, and that's that's been I think in the early days, if people hadn't made it so easy for me then it would have been more difficult for me to stick to it. But yeah, indifference. Let's champion indifference because I think that's the way forward. It's, it's <laughs> nice. It's nice because you don't always want to talk about it. I mean, clearly you didn't have a problem. I I feel that I did have a problem and I've been quite open about that. But you don't always want to talk about it. You don't <laughs> always want to go through the process of explaining why you made the choice that you made. And yeah, I've just been delighted by pretty much every by everyone just sort of not really caring, not in a dismissive way, but it's oh okay, you know, it's not it's not a big deal. I'm happy. You're happy with me to carry on drinking, you know. I'm happy with you to not drink, and that's sort of the situation I've got with most people I socialise with. But I think at the beginning, I I sort of probably avoided for a month or two a few situations where I thought I might be tempted. Did you change anything about your life even in those early weeks? Um, I don't recall specifically changing anything at all. So my wife and I used to love a gin and tonic um, of an evening. And we'd go to the pub regularly and I'd, I'd always have a beer. Um, and I didn't want that to change in terms of our social life. Um, so we still go to the pub. I have lunch at the pub regularly, but just don't drink alcohol when I'm there. Yeah. And, and I remember saying to the landlord, who's a really good bloke, Ross, I said to him, mate, I've, I've stopped drinking. And he looked at me like it was the end of the world. He's like, <laughs> I said, I'm still going to come. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> he thought his profits are about to plummet. Yeah. And I, to me, I've been true to my word. And, and I probably go more because sometimes I might not have gone because I thought I don't want to get stuck in that mode of like, I'm going for one and I end up having six. And, you know, the, another day is wasted. But uh, yeah, I mean, uh, nothing specifically that I did to change my habits, to be honest with you, other than stopping drinking. There was nothing that I can recall specifically changed. I found it very easy. My wife was very good about it. She still drinks. She's, I mean, she lives with me, for Christ's sake. She's got it, you know. <laughs> so, um, and she's an Arsenal fan, so absolutely. <laughs> and I'll support her in that, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> but both things, yeah. yeah. Great. But um, no, I don't remember anything changing. There's been some massive positives that I didn't expect. One was that I can actually drive the two of us home from a date, which is fantastic. Mm. I absolutely love that. Um, and the main thing is that, that feeling the next day where you were, I never regularly got drunk, uh, but I always had enough to feel it the next day. And there was a lethargy that crept in. The older I was getting as well, the worse it was getting. And sometimes I was losing whole days because I just couldn't get going after uh, a night of alcohol. So, I don't miss those hangover days, as I call them, at all. I'm really glad they've gone. And as a broadcaster as well, I mean, if you look at what you're doing at the moment, but really throughout the season, there must be a lot of times where you in particular, you, you're working in the evening and then you've got to be back on air in some form first thing in the morning. I mean, when you've been away at, I mean, God, how many World Cups and Euros have you covered? Loads, I'm sure. Like there must have been times when you've been abroad on those things where it stayed at late after a game and then you're, 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 you're broadcasting the morning. I mean, you must be, a, I know you broadcast this morning and last night. You yeah. must feel much sharper. Do you feel, do oh, you yeah, it's that? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, a couple of things on that, not just feeling, I do feel sharper. You're absolutely spot on. Uh, but also if, you know, sometimes it's really busy. I'll be away on Monday night, a Tuesday night, a Wednesday night at games. Mm. And sometimes I'll finish a game, uh, on a Monday night, I'll get away from the stadium, get to a hotel, and I'll think, Christ, I've got loads to do. Now, if I've had a few beers, uh, once I've had some alcohol, I can't work at all. That's just mm. the way my brain is. How people do that, I don't know. So to not drink anymore means I can work at any time. So if I'm still buzzing at, like, midnight and can't get to sleep because the game's been so electric, 
I can just sit down and do some work for the next day and I'm very, very productive. It's fantastic. On tours, so I've done 10 tournaments. This is my 10th yeah. tournament, which, you know, if you told me I'd be doing 10 tournaments when I was five years old, yeah. wow, it's, it's, it's a dream come true, literally, and I never take it for granted. But you do have some fun on these trips as well. But it's mainly work. And one of my things is that I'm there to work. That's one of my mantras, you know. I'm not there as a tourist. And I like to work every single day of the... I'm out here for well over 30 days. So I like to work every single day. I remember in Russia in 2018, <laughs> um, it was the day before the World Cup final. And on the World Cup final day, I was meant to be doing a show um, uh, before the World Cup final itself. Um, just a preview show kind of thing in Moscow. So went out the night before with a couple of friends, Emma and, and David, and we had a great time. One of the best nights ever. It was fantastic. Um, we went to a rooftop bar, then went to a FIFA um, function, which was a bit bit dull, but there were some celebs there. So it was, it was too good to talk about afterwards. Then went to this nightclub with, with karaoke and all sorts. And the night just went on and on, and it was utterly fantastic. Just one of those memorable nights. But slowly you're getting more and more drunk. And I remember thinking, I sat down, was watching my mate Dave do karaoke, and I thought, I really should get to bed. This is it. I'm done. <laughs> So I said goodnight to him and I left. And as I'm leaving this nightclub, very swish nightclub, as I'm leaving this nightclub, I look up and I think, so I recognised somebody. I saw somebody I recognised. And I thought, oh, is that who I think he is? And I couldn't place him. So I smiled and he smiled back at me. So I put out my hand to shake hands and I crashed into a mirror. <laughs> <laughs> oh my at, god <laughs> at that point i sobered up instantly the bouncers were falling around laughing ah, I ah, left. Ah, when i walked out it was daylight and there was a massive <laughs> force on the pavement and i thought What's going on here? the whole night is just one of the best ever it was fantastic but that's what drinking too much can do and mid-tournament to do that was not a great thing to do now this show the next day it was absolutely fine because what I did was I sobered up in the morning, well, overnight and then, well, overnight in the morning. I then went, my hangover cure in those days was uh, a Coca-Cola, bag of salt and vinegar crisps and a good meal. Mm. So I went for this stroganoff on a on a boat on the river in the middle of Moscow <laughs> on my own, um, having had salt and vinegar crisps and Coca-Cola for breakfast. And I was okay <laughs> to do the show, but... That that night, which was great, and and the day after, and doing the show came back to me recently when we came out here, and I thought to myself, that wasn't the best way to do things. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So that's that's not going to be. It just doesn't happen now. I'm not saying the quality of my work has improved in any way whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to think there won't be days when I'm calling in sick just because I've had a few too many beers. That just won't be happening. I mean, that is an interesting thing you say about quality of work. Because here's another thing that I worried about, and I wonder if, if you did too, is that, um, you know, there there is creativity and imagination in, involved in in the, the work that, that I do and that you do as well. I mean, you know, one of your fantastic uh, ability skills as a broadcaster is to think of a, a unique counterintuitive angle, right, that, that you often don't hear other people in the media take which I think is is creative. It, it's, it, you know, it takes a, a certain way of thinking. Did you ever worry that without drinking your life, I'm not saying you came up with these ideas when you were drunk, Adrian. That's not what I mean. But what I mean is, did you think it would change the way that you thought somewhat or change your kind of spark? What a great question. And that's probably, uh, that's probably the best question about the whole thing. Because I really love my work. Uh, I mean, I really love it. It's it, it's what I've always wanted to do. And yeah, you're right. I mean, when I'm thinking about, I love music as well. And we bumped into each other at a gig recently, didn't we? we? Did. This, this came about. Um, but when you read about the lives of those musicians who come up with incredible albums, etc., they're all fueled by substances, mm. generally speaking. Um, and so therefore... Although I'm not on that level, you're right to think, well, that creative spark, that flow has got to come from somewhere. And I think some of the some of the best lines I've done, not necessarily in terms of 
the counterintuitive arguments because I think that for me generally they came naturally anyway. I was mm. always um, quite contrary as a kid, so I think that those were those were in me somehow. I don't know why, but um, there are some lines that there was a line I did after um, a game in Russia actually, Portugal three, Spain three, and I said. Um, if I could marry a football match, I'd marry this one. <laughs> now those creative lines, that, that was done when yeah. I'm totally over. But you're right. Yeah. I did think to myself, right, okay, is this gonna is this gonna cleanse my brain so much that I'll just be able to think in boring tunnel vision, you know, no creativity, nothing interesting, nothing exciting. Is that how it's gonna be? And actually, being at gigs is, is an interesting one because it takes me a little bit longer without alcohol to really get into the gig. Okay. So I'm I'm not a dancer, but the music that does get me going is the Smiths and anything by the clash. So those two, I will throw my body around in a, in a really awkward fashion. The rest, I'll just stand still. And actually I've, I've been to a few Smiths tribute gigs since um, in the last year, since I stopped drinking and it's been, it's taken me a little bit longer to get into it. So there are some songs like This Charming Man where I'm, mm. I will just like, I'll, I'll get going straight away and, and there won't be a problem. However, I think it's taken maybe half an hour, 40 minutes to properly get into that zone. Whereas if I'd had a couple of drinks, I would be loose and feeling like I could do it anyway. Yeah, I don't see it as a drawback, to be honest with you. My dancing's not that good. <laughs> um, and in the end, I, I end up having a good time anyway. It, it, it just takes a little bit longer for that to start happening. I'm enjoying the music. Don't get me wrong. I'm yeah. not having a bad time. I'm not standing there thinking, God, when am I going to start dancing? Yeah. I'm really enjoying the music. It's like you said, that clarity of, of thought processes and hearing and, and understanding means that you understand that what's going on a bit more. I've been watching like the bass player thinking, how on earth is he playing the bass to Barbara's and begins at home? It just doesn't make <laughs> sense, yeah. you know. Um, and, and understanding bass lines a little bit more and how complicated they are, you know, and, and, and appreciating that work more. So there's no, I don't see it as a big drawback. Um, and if I really want to dance, I will just start dancing anyway and people are going to have to put up with They're it. They're just going to have to live with it. I I'm, I deeply regret that. I, we did bump into each other at a Smith's tribute gig and I didn't see you dancing. I might have missed it because <laughs> I only saw you towards the end, but I, that would have been something I would like to have seen. I find, I mean, I think those things actually over time, you relax more into being the sober version of yourself and, and all of those things kind of evolve. You know, uh, to take that gig as an example... The, the emotion you see around you from people who are mostly drunk, but in a not in a kind of an aggressive or irritating way, in a sort of a beautiful way. I kind of look at there's the I've been to see that band twice now. And when they do uh last night, I dreamt that somebody loved me. And and there's and he's he's saying it is that where he's going, I've seen this happen in other people's lives and now it's happening in mine. And the yeah. line goes over and over again. And both times I've been to see that band. There is a room full of people who I always think they're kind of middle aged, similar age to us. They you know, might be parents or might be exhausted. They've got all the worries in the world that middle aged people have. They've been through it all and all the rest of it. They probably don't have quite as much fun as they once did. And there's this whole room and both times I've been there stone cold sober. And rather than look at the band, I've just looked around at these people and some of them have got tears in their eyes and all of us. A chant, you know, I've seen this happen in other people's lives and that happened in mine, which sounds bleak, but it's in fact, there's something inexplicably beautiful about it. And that's what I mean by feeling more engaged. I kind of look at them all and I feel all of this like beautiful emotion. And I just think you you become more open to it because alcohol is a is a is a numbing substance to, to your feelings. Mm. Which takes me on to the deeper part of this chat. Sorry, go on before I go on. Can I, can I just say on that? It's that joke isn't funny anymore. Not last oh, yeah. night. Oh, sorry. But yeah, yeah. I think the same applies to last night and, and to a lot of Smith's songs. I had that exact feeling. So um, one of my wife's friends is a massive Smith's fan. And I've been trying to persuade her to come to a Smith's with a Y tribute yeah. band gig. And she wasn't having it. She just waits to see Morrissey. Yeah. She came along, brought her, her two kids who are big Smith's fans, and they absolutely loved it. And just for me to stand at the back and see them fully appreciating yeah the joy and the emotion and and they did a sleep and it's her favorite song and and she was like very very emotional ruth was and it was just a it was such a beautiful thing and you're right i wouldn't have experienced 
them experiencing that yes. if I had, had too much to drink. So I totally 100% agree. And for people who, who might be listening to this and they don't really get it, you know, that doesn't make any sense to them. It When you're in that moment, it absolutely makes sense. And it's a beautiful thing. I, I put it down to going back to being a, a kid. When, you, when I first heard the Smith songs and I was a teenager, I wasn't necessarily drinking. I'd have been 14 or 15. Certainly wasn't drinking on a regular basis. And there was a clarity of, of thought then. They first hit your consciousness, those words, those lyrics, that music. Yeah. And it for me, I believe it takes you back to that moment. And that's why it's such an emotional thing. It's a beautiful thing. Yeah, I think that's why they're quite unique atmosphere at those gigs. Um, but, you know, by the way, listeners, if you're contemplating a life without alcohol, you don't have to be into the Smiths music. There are other bands who will have this effect on you. Um but yeah, I, I just think that experiencing the, the feelings in a raw way. I, I often think same football uh, drink is fun. I very much remember the fun I had and the excitement I felt being being drunk. But the it's kind of the same type of feeling, no matter what the situation is, because what you're feeling is a bit drunk or sometimes very drunk. And whether it's Christmas or your birthday or a football match or a gig, the feeling is the same, but actually all of those experiences are different and unique and beautiful in their own way. And to experience them fully, it's quite nice to try them sober. And it does feel unusual the first time you do it and the second and third. But in the end, you start to discover things that you'd forgotten about. I think I was, I always say, I started getting pissed on Christmas Day when I was about 12 and didn't stop till I was 40. <laughs> and my first sober Christmas, when I was like 41, I guess, I was like, oh no, when I, yeah, when I was 40, that would have been my first um, sober Christmas since like the 80s. And I was like, wow, Christmas is great. It's so <laughs> much fun. And people go, well, yeah. And I said, yeah, I know, but I didn't really realize. I just thought it was like a day where you could start drinking extra early. For the... <laughs> but now I'm like really seeing how much fun it is. It's same with gigs, same with football, same with loads of great moments. Um, but, you know, people, whether they think about it or not, are often, you know, uh, when they when they drink, they're distracting themselves from feelings. Uh, you know, I just want to go back to what you mentioned around discovering uh, a long lost brother, which, by the way, is something I had with a long lost sister as well. Very, very similar. Right. But I was 20 when she came into my life. And, and again, mm -hmm. I'd had I'd had no idea of her existence. And then suddenly mm -hmm. I had a sister. And these things are confusing and hard to process. And uh, similarly, an absent dad which was another thing that was confusing and hard to process. So uh, without going too Freudian on you, how much of a role do you think you're giving up drinking tied into all of those complicated feelings that you were dealing with? I think it had loads to do with it. Let me, I'm going to take you back and, and I'll keep it as brief as possible because it doesn't need too much detail. I was brought up by a single mum and she never drank, but she had a lot of mental health issues, um, emotionally very disturbed. Um, and it wasn't, easy and that's an understatement but she'd been knocked around by my dad who um he was not a good man at all um didn't really work uh just used to it was a he was a criminal basically petty criminal bordering on the um hard criminal uh, at times not a good man at all but luckily i never met him so mm. They divorced in 1967. I was born in 1969. He was the dad. I think it's fair to assume I wasn't conceived out of love. Let's put it that way. Mm. Um, but he was a big drinker and he was a he was a horrible bloke anyway. But when he'd had a drink, he was a monster. These were the stories I was fed when I was growing up. And they're all true. Um, and I've seen various police statements, witness statements, reports and all sorts, newspaper reports about him and stuff. So... You know, it's it's all true. This wasn't my mum making all this stuff up. So all of that is is with you. It's 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 in your background. It's it's in your history. But you crack on with life. You don't really realise what's going on. You just get on with it. We were always told, don't try to find your dad, which we never did. Um, and little did we know that he had uh, a couple of other families along the way. So he had a marriage before... Uh, we came along, there was one after as well. So there might be other half siblings out there I've got no idea about. But when he died in, he died in sort of uh, June, two years ago. Um, I think it's right, I'm right in saying. And uh, 
the there's a company that contacted me, an estates management company contacted me saying, are you the son of this guy? And I said, yes. Um, oh, well, you've got a, a half brother who wants to connect with you. So I was a bit taken aback. Talked to my sister about it. So we decided we'd go for it. Um, we met up. A lovely fella. Absolutely lovely fella. And him and his wife were, were brilliant. We met up once. They all had lunch together and it was lovely. But it dragged back a load of horrible memories and stuff. And it brought my dad to the forefront of my mind and consciousness that it really shouldn't have done. I didn't really need it. So I was in two minds. He was a lovely bloke, but it, had, it hadn't been a positive experience for me. So we met up again. And we actually really hit it off. I mean, he's such a great guy, really into sport, really into football. The amazing thing was, as I'm driving the car back on that uh, Sunday in last June, I said to him, so you're really into football? Do you listen to talk sport? He said, yeah. He said, I've got the app on my phone. He said, I've listened to it since day one. I said, well, did it never occur to you that this guy called Durham, who's got the same name as you, and he's from Peterborough, yeah. and you were born in Peterborough, and he supports Peterborough and you support Peterborough as well. Yeah. Didn't hurt to you. You might be related at any point. And he said, No, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and and listen, uh, it, it was a beautiful thing in some ways. It was an ugly thing in other ways. But a couple of months after that meeting that we had in June, he uh, got ill on hos- in on holiday, went to hospital, and he passed away. So we met up twice. Oh. So my half brother who'd just come back into my life is gone. I'm still in, on good terms with his widow and um, he had a sister who wasn't related to me in any way. Different mum, different dad. Yeah. So he had a half sister and me and her hit it off as well. And we're good pals. So there's some good that's come out of it. But it all brought back the the memories of my mum telling me about my dad, you know, demanding, ordering me not to try and find him at all. Never try and find, you know, any of his family or whatever. Um and then that brought back to me how bad a man he was. And I just thought, this is going to be the way forward. I'm just going to... He was a monster when he'd had a drink. People talk about nature and nurture. I never met the fella. But I didn't want to be like him in any way whatsoever. So I thought, okay, I'm just going to stop drinking, see how it goes. And that's that's why it happened. But it, all of that stuff happened in... The, you're talking about the space of three months or so, four months. Yeah. You know, from finding out, then meeting him then meeting up again in the place where my dad died and then my half brother passes away. Wow. And like, this was last summer. And my mind was like, I was gone completely. I mean, yeah. I was another planet. So my wife whisked me off on holiday to the wilds of Scotland. Nobody could have found me if they tried to find me. And it was, it, it was a recovery process all the time, not drinking, going, went to gigs when we were there, went to football when we were there, still not drinking at all. And it just turned out to be the right thing to do. So I feel like loads of positive stuff has come out of what was a very upsetting and difficult situation. So I'm grateful because it's it's worked out fine. So processing those all of those feelings and all of that trauma, you think that alcohol being alcohol free has, has helped you do that, helped you f- feel those feelings a bit more, you know, rather than, do you think there was a sense that sometimes you you drink consciously or otherwise because you didn't want to think about that stuff with your dad or your childhood yeah. or your mum or any of that? I, I think so. I mean, I find it a bit weird that my mum didn't drink at all I and mean, she never touched a drop because mm. of him. Right. Um, and yet I did drink, but that I suppose it's what my peers were doing um, at the time. And that's, you know, you go off to university, you get into work and... You know, that's what you the people around you are doing. So you fall into those social circles. But I do feel like if I had still been drinking, I think it would have been easy for me to take that drink into another level to deal with what happened in those four or five months last year. That you know, it was a it was a really difficult time. And I'd taken the decision already at that time not to work. Because I'd been working so hard, I was, I was I was blitzed basically, and I'd taken the decision in the summer to have six weeks off work. Yeah, and work keeps me really grounded and and keeps me going basically. So it was a bad timing, really bad timing, and probably the worst thing that could have happened me not working. Um, because you took that away, and all of a sudden I'm like, 
you know, I'd rub, rub it in the headlights. If I'd still been drinking at that point, I think it could have been disastrous. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Um, so I, again, I'm grateful that I made that decision to stop drinking and uh, and it and it all worked out fine. Yeah, the worst case scenario, if if I was still drinking, the worst case scenario doesn't bear thinking about there. I don't think. It sounds like you know you've got a very good relationship, close relationship with your wife, and you know that she could see this coming, and she sort of helped you and supported you and understood presumably how bad things had got yeah absolutely well she was right there yeah absolutely i mean i um yeah i messaged her when i dropped my sister off and on that that day in june at wolverhampton i dropped them we had some lunch together and i dropped them all off and before i started the journey back down the a1 i messaged my wife and said uh i'm really not in a good place um i'm gonna stop drinking and I'm just going to see how it goes. Um, if you could just, you know, be on board with that, that'd be great. And that was all that was needed, really. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she's, she's, yeah, she's on another level, really, which is remarkable because she is an Arsenal fan. And <laughs> she, she was a listener before she met me, and yet uh, still, she's, she's. I was uh, astonished. Yeah, I, I met met her briefly at the gig <laughs> where we bumped into each other. When you told me she was an Arsenal fan, I couldn't. I thought it was a joke at first. I thought, how on earth has he ended up? Or, <laughs> Well, I should put it the other way. How on earth as an Arsenal fan ended up with Adrian Durham? It's one of the richest ironies in football. It is, isn't it? But <laughs> no, she's been she's been great, really, truly supportive. And, and yeah, I mean, she's from such a great family that you know it's she can't really understand how a family becomes so dysfunctional. But mm. wow, she she's been yeah, she's without her, it would just be again another scenario I'm not worth thinking about you because you you can't do it without those people you know and on the drink thing she never gave me any grief whatsoever she loves the fact that I drive us home after a yeah. day she absolutely loves that so um yeah she's she's been yeah it, it's inc- you get me emotional now she's been incredible just just supporting me through that but that time we went to Scotland you know I was I felt like I was on the brink and she sort of hauled me back in that two weeks we were away. And and by the time I came back, the outlook was much more positive. I was still dealing with it, still dealing with it now. But um yeah, that was it was perfect timing and she she got it just right. Let's put it that way. There are there's certainly times when things get really tougher. It's important to have someone who can literally just keep a close eye on you. Yeah. Just be close and just watch in case you know you could do something crazy so those of us who have those people in our lives are very lucky and i think you know it's why it's why i suppose the messaging we give out and i know talk sport do a lot of great stuff uh, messaging around mental health and stuff and people say make sure you're talking i used to think why <laughs> i hate talking right about that stuff anyway but it is true it's like you know it's it, it just just to safeguard yourself to have someone you can be honest with do you do you have mates? Do you do you have you spoken? I mean, you're very open here today, which I really appreciate greatly. Um, uh, have you found it easy to open up to people about your feelings and stuff like that, despite the kind of you know banter heavy, blokey environment that you work in? Yeah, more so recently that, and and with that background that I've got with the dad I had, it was something because my mum said don't go and find him and you know don't talk about him or anything like. That. It's something I literally didn't talk about for 50 years, you know, and mm. um, it it was, you just could not mention his name. You couldn't talk about it. So all that stuff and, and knowing things I knew and, you know, stuff that I saw went on when I was little, you know, it's just it's something that you I w- literally wasn't allowed to talk about until I realized, well, what's the worst thing that's going to happen if I do talk about it? Nothing, literally nothing bad's going to happen. Um, I always thought if I talk about it, I'm in massive trouble, you know, and and I thought it would be the end of my world, my marriage, my career, my kids wouldn't like me, all that sort of stuff. So to get that stuff out of your head, you know, those consequences that wouldn't happen, you know, Mm. breaking down that barrier was hard, first of all, but yes, there are people I, I've talked to. I had ten years of therapy to to deal with it. That was the first step. Um, so from 2012 to 2022, I was in I was in treatment 
just working all of that out, you know, that family background stuff and, and some of the shame of what, you know, my dad did, which I think will be understandable to most people. But when you then when you throw in the fact that I never met him, mm. it, it kind of blurs it. And sometimes people, when I've talked about it, have said, well, what's it got to do with you? You, you weren't there, you know, you didn't know him. And they're absolutely right, but it still affects you quite deeply, you know. Yeah. So, um, yeah, there are people. I, I kind of choose you. I, I do believe in the the talking thing. You're absolutely right, but I think it's only worthwhile if you've got the right people to talk to. Because mm. I remember talking to one one friend of mine quite early. This was quite some time ago. We were I went to see him. We were mates at uni. Well, friends at uni. We've been friends since we were eighteen, and we're still friends now. We go to football together. He's a big Man City fan, um, and I started to speak to him about some of the stuff that had gone on. And he stopped me and said, I think you're talking to the wrong person. I, I haven't got a clue how to deal with all this. I haven't got the right things to say to you. I'm sorry. Yeah. Which at the time I was like, wow. But actually, if you're not capable of dealing with that, then it's probably best to say you can't deal with it. Yeah. So I think talking is great. Talking to the right person, I think, is, is even greater. So, yeah, I think people have been have been very good about it and understanding about it. I don't go around the world shouting about, you know, what's going on in my life, you know, it's, but I do, you know, if, if there are friends with whom I will sit down and absolutely talk about it. And if I need to talk about it, so yeah, you're right. And you found the experience 10 years of therapy that that was helpful. That was constructive. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think that to put it, to use the phrase she used, um, my brain needed rewiring mm. really and, and and that was absolutely true um there were ways of me thinking that just led back to you know shame of um who my dad was and uh that was holding me back because then i didn't get into this career to be famous or anything like that to even be the z list or celebrity or whatever i loved radio and i loved football from a very young age and that's why I got into the career. It was never about, you know, being well known or, you know, I haven't got an agent. I'd like to think I haven't got too big an ego, certainly not an unhealthy ego. You know, I don't have my own website. I don't I don't really promote myself as such. It's it's not it's not about that. I don't do all those things. I don't do freebies to Dubai and all that sort of stuff. Mm. None of that is me, because I just wanted to be on the radio talking about football. That's mm. Well, part of me wanted to be talking about politics, but as it turned out, the career went to football, and that was equally fine as well. So I, I when you get in that position, and I wouldn't say I'm like a mega celebrity, but I think I might just qualify for, I don't know, celebrity master chef or something like that. I don't know. Yeah. Um, so that level, do you know mm, what I mean? Mm. Um you have to be careful about what you do and and you know the, the things that you say and how you are in public and all of that. And so I, my thought process was, oh, the more well-known you get, well, what if they find out that my dad was a criminal? You know, they're going to take my career away from me. And it's crazy thinking, but that's because I was a little bit crazy and I was thinking yeah. things. So the therapy helped me just to rewire, put things back into a normal way to understand what was going on in my life. And actually, if people did find out that my dad was a criminal, I'm not going to have my career taken away from me. Or if I am, it will be incredibly unfair of somebody to do that to me. So, you know, I, I, the fear of being outed for having a criminal dad is like, it was it was weighing very heavy on me for years and years and years because my mum had said, don't tell anyone about this. Mm. Now I'm doing this. I, I can't, it doesn't bother me at all. It's, it doesn't define me. You know, it's it's not really part of, well, it is part of me, but it's not something I could control. And I think when I've spoken to people about it, friends about it, it's something that they sympathise with and empathise with more than, they're never going to criticise me for it, are they? So the therapy was absolutely necessary, yeah. Takes away a lot of guilt and shame. I mean, those are two of the things, aren't they, that mm. so sort of like, toxic and pointless but so many of us carried them around probably the biggest my favorite cliche that i've got through recovery and therapy of my own stuff is the truth will set you free mm. because when you carry around 
like the burden of shit you're trying to hide about yourself. Uh, none of which very often anyone cares about anyway or won't won't make a, a, a difference. Sometimes it will, but then, you know, once you just embrace it, then it's, it's so liberating, isn't it? It like makes life so much easier. I think, you know, that was linked into my drinking was, you know, there's certain secrets or, or pieces of shame you got about yourself and you kind of keep it inside. And you, I used to just drink probably because I found it so exhausting to carry that stuff. But the truth really does set you free, and I'm delighted that's happened for you. Um, just, just lastly, before we wrap up, I just want to talk about, you know, you've had this fantastically successful broadcasting career. Uh, what is it? How many years at TalkSport has it been now? 25, is it? 25, yeah. 25 years at TalkSport. I am in awe of any broadcaster who can do that over so many years and maintain the sort of standards that you have and still be fresh and still be passionate. Um, it, it isn't. I mean, it's a lot of fun, right? Um, mm. and, and people, you know, not just obviously the work you're doing, and you, you know, traveling the world talking about football, fantastic, and also the atmosphere of working with other great broadcasters, and also all those great sports people who you worked with and got to know over the years, and that's all great. But it is exhausting, Adrian. It must be. It's so exhausting. I mean, I've never done a stint anywhere near a fraction of yours on any show I've ever done, but I find it exhausting and stressful. It can be competitive. It can be unforgiving. How have you coped with all of that over the years? That's a great question. Um, I was just about to say alcohol helped me cope. With it. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't at all. No, that's not true. Um, I think uh, you break it down into three parts, really. My certain talk sport career, so the first part of it was I was doing the evening show, the kickoff show from the studio. Um, then I did drive in 2006. I did it for 15 years. And then for the last three years, I've been doing live football. I'm, I'm the chief live football anchor, which basically means I do Premier League games, championship games, Champions League, England, which is the big thing for me, um, tournaments, etc. This is the job. This one now is the one I always wanted to do. The drive show was that was when it was really intense. You yeah, know, coming up with ideas and being creative because you've got to be, you've got to inform and entertain on a drive show. In my opinion, to, to, for it to be successful, it's got to be informative. It's got to be entertaining, um, and to keep that up. Uh, initially, it was five days a week, Monday to Friday, and then we did it Monday to. No, it was always five days a week. What am I talking about? Um, so yeah, we, it was always five days a week. To do that five days a week and come up with three hours of content and entertainment and inf information, plus stay on top of news stories, breaking stories, not just sport, breaking news stories as well. And I've got a background in news, which really helped with that. Um, that was the most intense period. Now, I'm not saying what I do now is easy at all. The traveling and uh, late nights and all of that, being away from home, it, it makes it quite difficult. The work, though, I have, all of it for the 25 years, I've absolutely loved it. The work, it, it's not, not at any point have I thought to myself, gosh, he's getting dull or, oh, this is so boring. Never. I mean, I'm one of those weird guys who I think that there's joy to be had in any football match. So our football editor, Jason, says to me, um, look, I'm really sorry, but we, we've got to send you to Palace Bournemouth this week. I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> you a fantastic footballer. Yeah. Lewis Cook, Bournemouth's midfield. I think he should be in the England squad. Can't yeah. wait to go and see him. That's me. Yeah. Okay? And that could be at any level of football. Like The first game I went to last season was Kelty Hearts against Wraith Rovers. And I, I watched it and I was thinking, I think Wraith have got a chance this season. And sure <laughs> enough, the title race come the end of the season, they make the playoffs. Yeah. You know, it's, and I love stuff like that. Just just going to see different things. A different thing happens every single football match you go to. So yeah, I'm still full of joy for football. And and after this long, I don't think it's going to be going. I've had that joy since I was six. So, And that's from watching Peterborough United. So <laughs> I still will have that joy. That's the thing. I'm, I'm getting paid to talk about football and watch football. So, mm. you know, it's... So when you're flagging or you feel low on energy or yeah. you, you you remind yourself of that? Mm. I think so. It's it kind of, I automatically, I don't have to you know consciously remind myself of that. It automatically happens, really. I'll, I'll just have a moment where I'm thinking, 
oh, hang on a minute, look at the job you've got. It's sensational. And I've always said, because the early days of talk sport, people were getting fired left, right and centre, you know, and for no reason whatsoever. We had a, what was called a talk sport holiday, which was you went on holiday, you got back and your job had gone. Yeah. You know, so, and that used to happen regularly. And, and I survived all of that. And I'm very grateful I survived all of that. But, you know, you and, and, and I think to myself, wow, I'm still here. I'm so grateful still to be here. It's And it's a, it's a joyous thing. I will mention as well the people I work with. I'm very lucky, especially in this new job that I've got. The, the same new job, been doing it three years, the live football. Mm. The people I work with, uh, there's not one person on the team you think, oh, you know, they're all fantastic people. And and I'm not just saying it. They really are. Mm. It's, it, it's a wonderful thing. But, yeah, I love it, mate. I love football. I still love radio as well. So I've, I'm, I'm absolutely blessed. From what was the most impossible i think childhood up until well into my early 20s suddenly things click together and i feel like it's a bit of a reward for the first 20 odd years being so shit <laughs> well, that's a lovely way to think of it and as for the drinking it's been a year how do you feel about it now is it forever or is it all kind of just see how it goes it feels like it's forever i do remember saying to my wife if it lasts a year we'll crack open a bottle of champagne on the anniversary. Right. Well, I'm in Dusseldorf. Uh, she's in the UK, so that's not going to be happening anyway. But it, it wouldn't have happened. Yeah. I'm very happy not drinking. I think it's made me a better person. I feel much better with myself, much more confident with myself as well, actually. Um, and I feel more free and able to do things generally, like drive. Yeah, <laughs> and yeah. I think and the clarity is, is, is so important to me right now. So... I'm, I can't see myself going back to drink at all, and, and I'm very, very comfortable and happy with that. Adrian, it's such a pleasure to catch up with you. I'm so glad it's gone uh, so well for you this last year and, and that life's feeling positive. And I really, it's a real privilege as well for you to have opened up and been so honest today with me and the listeners. So I'm very grateful for that, mate. Thank you ever so much. Yeah, no worries, mate. It's, listen, you... I thought about doing it and and when you asked and, and I thought, well, if you're going to do it, why not open up? I mean, I'm in a safe space with you, so no good. problem at all. I'm really glad you feel that way. And we both sat and we both strangely share the same sober anniversary as well, which is how we remembered that this was the day to do it. Because both of us, by coincidence, uh, uh, celebrate on the 25th of June. So uh, hopefully we'll be checking in with each other for many more 25ths of June to come. Yeah, I don't mind doing that. It actually blew me away when I realised it was the same day. It's, it is pretty special. So, yeah, maybe we should do one every year on the date. That'd be great. That'd be great. All right. Well, enjoy the rest of the Euros. Cheers, and mate. Uh, all the best. Thanks, Adrian. Up the iron. <laughs> <laughs> that was the excellent Adrian Durham, a broadcasting hero of mine. I'm really honoured that he chose to come on the pod and be so honest and open. You can hear Adrian on TalkSport all summer covering the Euros and throughout the football season covering English football in his own unique style. Thanks for listening, gang. Please subscribe to The Reset if you don't already at sandelaney.substack.com. You'll find four years worth of interviews, podcasts and my writing on mental health, sobriety, life and much more. Until next time, be lucky and don't let the dickheads get you down. <laughs>